special tonight. We will be reading from the book, and Diana will join her in conversation, and you'll have your chance to ask questions after that. So please, join me in welcoming to the stage, Layla Motley and Diana Miller. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Such a warm welcome for Layla. Um, Layla, would you like to start by reading a little bit from the book? Yeah. Hi. 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 Thanks for being here. <laughs> All right, um, I'll give you a little intro. This is from the beginning of the book, so it won't be too complicated. But um, the main character, Kiara, is 17. And um, like the introduction said, she finds herself involved with a network of police officers. Um, and the investigation that follows is, is what the book is centered around. But um, this is with her best friend, Ale. And they've just come back from funeral day, which is a tradition where they go to funeral homes and they get clothes and food and, um, and then go to the park. So this is at the swings. Ale begins to swing her legs, me following her lead, going skyward. At the top, I think I might just enter one of those clouds. I look down, see a tent behind the basketball courts and an old man pissing by a tree, not bothering to look around and see who is watching. I aspire to be so reckless, so unassuming, that I could take a piss in San Antonio Park at noon on a Thursday and not even look up. Yeah. You know what I've been thinking? Ale asks me. We're on opposite ends of the sky, swinging toward each other and missing. And for the first time all day, I'm not thinking about the paper taped to our door, about Marcus's sleeping face, about how wide Dee's mouth opens. What you been thinking? Don't nobody ever fix none of these damn roads. She says it, and I immediately begin to laugh, thinking she was about to tell me some philosophical wondering about the world. You don't even got a car, what you worried about? I yell back to her, across the wind and the space between our swings. Even as I say it, looking out at the streets that extend from the park like the legs of a spider, I see what she means. Chunks of road sit beside holes they left behind, where wheels of broken down Volkswagens dip in, and for a second I don't know if they're gonna pull back out until they do, the only remnant of distress left in the slight rattle of the bumper. All the holes in Oakland never seem to leave nobody stuck for long. An illusion of brokenness. Or maybe that's just for the cars. Don't you ever think about how none of the streets around here have been redone for decades? Ale, a skater to the core, spends more time dipping in and out of potholes than I ever have. Why it gotta matter? The roads ain't hurting nobody. Don't matter. I'm just saying it ain't like this nowhere else, you know? Why Broadway not this torn up? Or SF? Because they put in their money in the city just like they put in their money into downtown. Don't you got a problem with that? Ale's whole body has risen from its slouch, and we're both slowing down now, returning from our sky. No, I don't got a problem with that. Just like I don't got a problem with Uncle Ty buying a Maserati and a mansion down in LA and leaving us out here alone. Just like I don't got a problem with Marcus spitting rhymes in a studio while I'm just trying to pay our rent. It ain't my place to have a problem with somebody else's survival. If the city get their money from paying to smooth over the roads on some rich ass street, then they should go ahead and do that. Lord knows I won't be thinking about nobody else if someone offers me a wad of cash. I wiggle my toes in my Sunday shoes as the swing comes to a halt and I feel Ale's eyes on me determined. I don't believe none of that, she says. What you mean you don't believe it? She shakes her head, her own high making her slow. Nah, you got too much heart to be a sellout, he. You ain't cruel enough for none of that. I know you wouldn't go leaving Marcus or Trevor or me just to make bank. I'd like to think she's wrong, but if she was, then I would stay on these swings all day, 
Get so high I don't have to think about nothing but always tattoos and how the streets are fragmenting and will keep disintegrating until we are walking on dirt. Instead, I think of Marcus, how we used to stand on street corners trying to sell paintings I made on cardboard. It barely made us enough to buy more paint, but Marcus and I were in it together, choosing each other. It's time I go tell him I can't be doing all the hard shit for him if he ain't gonna do nothing for me. Tell him it's time to put the mic down and face these streets like I've been for the last six months. I gotta go find Marcus, I say, hopping from the swing set and seeing the world fuzz, go in and out of focus, all of it sharp yet spinning. I leave her there, on the swings, a puff of smoke exiting her lips like she was holding it in this whole time. And she don't even have to look at me again because now this blazer smells like her Sunday shoes and today, on funeral day, that is all I need. Thank you, that was great. So how does it feel to have your big secret out in the room of happy people here? Um, I realized it was real, just as Josie said it, so um, pretty crazy, yeah. I was thinking maybe we could start um, by your explaining what night crawling means. So um, night crawling isn't validated by a dictionary, but it's a colloquial term that has a lot of meanings, and I kind of wanted to have this title represent the duality of Kiara's life. So um, night crawling means you know walking the streets at night in its most simple terms, but it also refers to sex work or dealing or all the things that we're forced to move underground into you know the street lamps. Um, and so I I wanted it to be a title that moved and a title that uh, was real to us and might not be validated by the world. Um, and as Josie pointed out in her introduction, um, you are also a poet. Um, and I think there's a lot of poetry in the book and in that title. Um, how does your poetry help your novel writing and vice versa? Um, I think I've been a poet for as long as I've been a fiction writer. So I think that uh, for me, they, they kind of bounce off of each other. Um, I love language, and I love cadence and rhythm, and I think that um, it's a core part of how I write my prose, too, so, yeah. And what made you decide that the story you wanted to tell in Night Crawling should be a novel? Um, I think that sometimes we turn politics into a very theory-based um, act and it becomes more about statistics and about what we think than what we know and feel um, and I think that the beautiful thing about fiction is that we can't distance ourselves from a character um, we can't we can't put that space between us and someone that we've grown to love um, and so I wanted this book to allow us to love people who we might not otherwise even think of and maybe, um, could you share with the audience a little bit of the stories behind the story, some of the inspirations that went into it? Yeah, so um, in 2016, a case broke in the Bay Area, where I'm from, um, about a young girl who was sexually abused by a network of Bay Area police officers. And um, this kind of case like rarely makes it to the media. There like maybe two or three other times that it has ever made it to a courtroom or a newspaper. And so it was a, it was a big deal in the city. There were attempts to cover it up. And I was a young teenager at the time watching this um, and really feeling like the, the weight of the reflection of how that meant we, as young girls, were just not going to receive any type of protection and were also going to be continually silenced in our attempts to voice our fragility. And so I wanted to write a story that um, gave more nuance than I think we're often given around what it means to be a survivor um, and, and to experience this type of just complete neglect by a system we're told is supposed to protect us. Um, but I also wanted it to be a story that would allow us to, to really get to know these people as people. 
Um, and so Kiara has the narrative control, and that doesn't mean she always has control over her own life, but she at least is able to tell her story in her own way. Um, so I kind of tried to get in the head of Kiara and, and do that. And, and, and you did give her a voice. I mean, you give her a first-person voice. She is the person telling the story. How, how did you find that voice? Was it a struggle? Did it come easily? No, it came first. I, I like to journal from my character's perspective, so I like to do a lot of just existing within them. I, um, I think that one of the, the best parts about writing in first person is that I have to get in the head of the character so much that it forces the reader to. Um, and so I wanted with Nightcrawling to just immerse myself entirely with Kiara. Um, so I, I wrote every day and I, I just kind of didn't leave her head, um, which meant that this story, you know, even if readers experience it as dark or um, depressing, which I've heard a couple times, I think that um, also when I was writing it, I didn't experience it as that because I don't think Kiara does. And I think that that's one thing that um, we often forget is that even when you're undergoing like, the worst thing that you can possibly think of, we always want more. Otherwise, we like can't move forward. Um, and I wanted to show her like vast spectrum of experiences too. Do you remember what the starting point was? Was there a particular scene or moment that was the beginning? It was the first line. The first line is the same except one word. Uh, and the first page is also pretty much the same. Uh, I think that I'm, I'm a linear writer, so I write from the beginning all the way through no matter what, and then I often change the beginning a lot. Um, and with this book, that first line was just it. It was the image that the book needed to start with and end with in the end. Um, and, and you talk a little bit about the balance of darkness and light in the book. And I think one of the things that's so remarkable about it is even though the subject matter can be tough, there is so much hope and life in it. Um, was that a conscious choice, or did that just come out of the writing? It was both. Um, I think that, again, when you live inside someone's head, like we experience more than one thing, um, even in a single moment. And I wanted the book to show that always first. And I think that especially when writing about black characters and like black violence, um, it's important that we see a character as a whole person. And that includes that hurt, but it also includes all of the things that I think we often stray from, even just the experience of grief, like how do we grieve? Um, and I think that I wanted the book to be more than one note, even though she is consumed by the things happening to her. Um, we all want more. Uh, and so a lot of the characters around Kiara to represent that. Um, so she has Trevor, who's the nine-year-old living next door, and he kind of allows her to enter childhood when she's otherwise not afforded the ability to, um, to be a kid. And then Ale, her best friend, wants nothing from her. And I think that as like black girls, we often experience the world wanting everything from us. Um, and to, to have one person who wants nothing was important. Well, it's really interesting that Kiara is 17 in the book, and she turns 18, and it's a big turning point for her because it enables her to do different kinds of jobs. It's sort of like becoming an adult in a lot of ways. Um, but she also is very much a child. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, I, there's been a lot of talk about your age. Um, <laughs> um, do, you, do you relate to that? I mean, do you feel... Like a child. Yeah, so I'm not in my forties. Secrets out. Um, I I mean I turned I went from seventeen to eighteen a couple years ago, so pretty recently. But I think that we all experience, you know, there, like nothing happens on the day that you turn eighteen. Like literally nothing happens, but the world believes that then they have more of a right to certain things from you. And I think that I wanted to show the way that, like, for Kiara, things change, but also they don't. And, um, and in terms of, like, sexual abuse by these, like, grown men um, who 
believe that it's okay once she's 18. I think I wanted to show like the ways in which she is the exact same person before and after, and they saw her the same before and after too, but it's, age is often used as a justification for violence on a, on a woman's body and on a girl's body, and so I wanted to show that too, but I think, I mean, I experienced no change on my 18th birthday. I signed my contract. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's like the big thing that happened. Um, but like, it's just another day you can vote. And that's like kind of it for the most part. Um, and I think that Kiara experiences that too, but also on her 18th birthday, the world decides to get something more. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, it's a wonderful moment in the book also. Trevor, the little boy, helps bake a cake for her, mostly made out of maple syrup. Um, so she had some things happen on her 18th birthday. Totally, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Kiara's family. I mean, we, we've heard a little bit about Marcus, but she has, she has an unusual family and sort of a, a broken family. Yeah, unusual and also, I think, kind of not in a lot of ways. Um, so Marcus is her older brother. He's like three years older than her. And he it has dreams of becoming a rapper. And he's not very good at it. But he thinks it's going to be his thing. And he thinks it's going to like get them into a different kind of situation. But um, in doing so, he like neglects his sister entirely, um, who is 17 and having to figure out like how to, how to pay the rent and get them food. Um, and I think I wanted to show how these two siblings, I mean, your sibling is the person who, like, knows what it means to be a child in your family the most. Like, no one else can know that the way your sibling can. And at the same time, I think often the gendered ways we raise kids leave those two, two kids who grew up similarly in entirely different positions because they know how to cope differently and they've been given different ideas of how to exist in the world and so Kiara believes it's her responsibility to care for everyone around her and Marcus believes that he should go after what he wants and it's his right to you know shoot his shot and I wanted to show that sibling dynamic and how that complicates the love that they clearly have for each other um, and then their parents are you know experiencing the reverberations of the justice system in very different ways um, and, and we see kind of a parallel with their parents of how um, her mom had to, you know, kind of try to parent while she was grieving for her husband's death. And I think that grieving while you're also caring and trying to, um, to support people through like daily life is nearly impossible. Um, and I wanted to show how she crumbles under that and how, you know, if Kiara continues the way that she's going, she will crumble too because there's no way to carry the weight of, of everyone you love. And what kind of research, if any, did you do into some of the worlds of the book, like the justice system and policing and sex work? I'm a reader, so I've always been like reading, and I read nonfiction and fiction, um, and lots of works by abolitionists and um, Black Panthers and you know people who've been doing this work for generations. And so I wanted to use that kind of background that I already had, but um, make it fiction, which fiction allows us to like make our ideas for ourselves on what is right and what is wrong. But you know the characters are living a life where it doesn't matter what is right or wrong, you know. Um, and so I wanted to to do that and to use that kind of knowledge that I had. But I also did a ton of research. I mean, I think any author researches really weird things, like you know, what type of spoon would you use to like stir the maple syrup cake and that kind of thing, where you like have to do research just to know how to to put a character in the most authentic place. Um, but I also did a lot of research on police sexual violence, which there is very little um, actual research on uh, for, for many reasons um, and very little reporting because how are you going to report to the people who are causing the harm in the first place? So um, I, I did a lot of research for what I could, but I also wanted it to not be too influenced by true stories, to have like a balance of this is like this is a character's life. And we need to we need to think of this character as a person that we know fully in a way we can't know another like living being. 
Do you think the world um, that the book is coming into is any different from the world you started writing the book from? It's a good question. Um, I mean, honestly, I think that I wrote the book in 2019, and then with the 2020 uprisings, um, I remember feeling like, wow, that we're still in a very similar place as we were in 2015 during the same uprisings in the book is set in 2015. Um, and I remember being at these protests and like listening to the Say Her Name chant, which was, you know, it's, it's an organization, a hashtag that was founded by a black woman, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who was trying to get other black women to be centered in, um, in our conversations about police violence. And um, so the idea is like the call and response is like say her name in the new no, like whoever has the megaphone will tell you whose name you're about to say. And so it would always start with, you know, like say her name, Sandra Bland. But then, like, just so quickly, it would shift into say his name. And the very purpose of that was to center black women. And so I think in many ways, like, we are still living in a world in which we are so uncomfortable with recognizing how we have harmed black women that we aren't even willing to incorporate it in the movements that are supposed to talk about this type of violence. That's sobering. Yes. Um, well, another aspect of the book um, that we haven't really talked about yet is um, the fact that it's full of suspense. Um, I mean, Kiara has both good and terrible things happening to her, but one of the things that you become really invested in as a reader is just finding out what happens. Um, is that something that just came along with the story as you were telling it, or did you have to kind of work up that suspense? When I wrote this book, I didn't know what plot was. So um, when I wrote it, I had no idea what I was doing in terms of plot, and I just kind of... It was vibes, and so I, I let it just run its course, and it's a lot different. It had no like real bone structure um, to it, but I honestly think that that's kind of where I wanted to start. Like we're in her head before we ever like paying attention to what happens around her, you know, because that's not what it's about, and. Um, and so when I learned how to plot, I, I like reverse like the whole process and added it back in to create this kind of like domino effect. Um, but I don't outline before I write. I like know what's happening in the next chapter and nothing else. Um, and I think that's because like it's more fun for me as a writer to not know what I'm about to do, and um, and I would be bored if I knew what was happening next. So I think that also for the reader, you know, you get to not know what's happening next because I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, even knowing that, was there anything that really surprised you as you were writing? Really surprised me. People have asked me this question before, and I don't know how to answer it ever, because I think it always feels inevitable, the next thing you write. Like, it just, it can't not happen. And that's part of why I do, like, I know what's happening in the next chapter, because it can't not happen in the next chapter. Um, so I don't feel like I was very surprised by where we ended up. But at the same time, like, characters do things, and I, I expected, like, some characters to be a lot more of a part of the story that faded from it very quickly. Um, but that's part of writing, right? You discover things, yeah. Um, and, and I'm going to steal this question from another interview you had because I thought it was so smart you answered it so beautifully. But um, do you feel like as you were writing that you were sort of being forced into certain tropes, like that Marcus wanted to be a rapper um, or that Trevor was into basketball, and how did you handle that? Give you the same response. I gave it that interview. Um, I think that it's really interesting to lean into tropes because they're there for a reason, and there are truths in them, and there are falsehoods. And so I, I like to lean into them and see like what, what is actually there beyond the, the normal dimension that we see, which is like one side of it, sure. Um, but like with Marcus, you know, the idea of a black rapper is not new for any of us. But thinking about how and why black boys are 
forced into this idea that in order to be successful, in order to thrive, they need to adhere to some kind of fame, which means that all of their value is put in what they do in being exceptional. And so I wanted to examine the ways that that then falls into having this this direct impact on you know Marcus's sister and and black girls and like how interconnected all of these things are. So I think that um, tropes are a fun way for me to play around with uh, the the constructions that the literary world already has and um, and change them because I think that's part of like what black art is is like flipping things on its head. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about Camilla? Um, because she's, I think, one of the most fascinating characters in the book, but she's sort of a side character. Mm -hmm. Camilla, um, she's a sex worker who is kind of like Kiara's introduction to sex work. And um, it was really interesting for me to play with that character again, like leading into the trope questions, because I, um, I knew that it was important that I show many of the different sides of sex work um, and and the different truths about how a person ends up in sex work and a way someone might feel about it. And so um, Camila kind of presents herself as someone um, who is experiencing some kind of like confidence and pride in the work that she does um, and empowerment in it. And I remember we, I was like really adamant that we needed to have a sex worker read this book. And I said like, how, how can we do that? Let's, let's get that happening. Um, and when a sex worker read the book and gave us feedback on it, um, I remember like really like reading all of these comments and noticing that like the main thing that she was saying was even when you want it, it's still hard. And um, even when this is the, your job of choice, even when you know you have other options and you choose to go into sex work, like there are things about every job that are hard, that are difficult for us to handle, and um, and there are also ways in which we must to like disillusion ourselves in order to make it through a day. Um, and so Camila kind of embodies that idea of um, of choice, and then what choice can lead to when you realize that there are like other people who do not care what you choose. Um, and so that, that's mostly what she, what she, what role she serves in the book. But she's also kind of this, um, this character, like she adds, she's always wearing like some kind of colorful uh, dress. It's fabulous style, yes. Mm -hmm, she does. <laughs> and, um, and I think for Kiara, there's this appeal of like getting to have some kind of control over your body and um, and whether you know you believe that Camila has that or not, I think that the idea of that is what so many of us are like looking for. Um, and can you talk a little bit about Oakland and the role that it plays in the book? How many of you are from Oakland? Yeah. 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 All right. Um, so for those of you who are not, um, <laughs> Oakland. I was born and raised in Oakland, and most of the book is set in East Oakland, because that's where I live most of my life. Um, and I wanted this book to be you know, an ode to the city um, and to all of the parts of it, because I think that often like people who aren't from Oakland have two ideas of Oakland, like either, oh, I really want to move there, like it seems <laughs> like it's like getting like really nice, or um, <laughs> did, like have you ever seen someone shot? Like I hear the crime is off the rails, and I think that both of those ideas are just so limited and not at all reflective of the Oaklands that like I live in. Um, and so I wanted to to create a story that like really shows Oakland for what it is in all of its dimensions, and it's like the most unique place on earth. There is nowhere like it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and so I I wanted that to come through in the book, and you know we have limited representation of Oakland in literature. Yeah. We have there there. And not much else. <laughs> and like I love there there so much. And I think that what is beautiful about it is that it's one version of Oakland and it is like very honest. And then there are like 10, 12, 20 other versions of this city that I think we never get to hear about. So this this was mine. And I'll try to ask this question, avoiding all spoilers. Um, 
but do you, as the writer, and you don't have to tell us what it is, but do you have a, a vision for what happens to Kiara? Do you imagine her future off the page? No, I think Molly, you ended up asking, <laughs> like, what happens to her? Um, and I think that I, I don't want to know. I wanted the ending to be full of possibility for her, um, but not to be closed, because I think that part of what she experiences is in the book is like being trapped into one, one way of being, and I wanted her ending to, to be more than that. So I knew that from the very beginning, and I knew that I did not want to put the hope in this book into the justice system. I didn't want that to be the point of the book. So if you're expecting like a thriller courtroom drama, like it's not that. Though there is thrilling, you know, aspects of it, and there are drama, and there is a courtroom, <laughs> but like none of those things are the most important thing about the book. And. It's also, I mean, in a lot of ways, there are all these love stories happening, which is not what you would expect from a book that has sexual violence in it. Um, but Kiara finds love in all sorts of places. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I love a romance. I'm a romantic. Um, so I like to have some, some aspect of like love in there. But at the same time, like, it is just not the focus of Kiara's life. And so I wanted it to kind of be, you know, a side plot, a side character. Like their love story, I'm not going to tell you who it is, is like just <laughs> not the center of her world. And I think that often when like you have a romance, like it is just right there in the middle. That is what you're like clinging on to. And like I, I love a romance too. Um, but I, I wanted us to want more from for her than, you know, love from one person. Um, so I think that there are, there are different love stories throughout the book. Also, like, Kiara's parents have one. Um, I just, I wanted it to be threaded throughout there, too. Well, and also, the love stories, but also the family dynamics, like what you were describing with Marcus, you know, people who love each other owe each other a lot, right? And there's a sense of obligation, but for Kiara, sometimes that obligation becomes too much for her to carry. So love is also sort of a burden for her, Yeah, you say? it is. I mean, care is is the part that I think that is hard for her. She loves them whether she wants to or not. Um, but having people expecting you to care for them in ways that they would never even consider Caring for you, I think that is like the core conflict of being a black woman in the world. Um, and you talked a little bit about color as a signal for um, Camilla, um, but Piara is also a painter in the book. Can you tell us how that works? Yeah, I have friends who tag. Hey. <laughs> um, and I think that um, if you if you ever go to Oakland. There, like you can't walk down the street without seeing at least one mural or work of graffiti, and I wanted that to like have a role, but also color just like plays a role throughout the whole book, um, and and I wanted Kiara to want something, um, and and I think that often like art is something that all of us can understand wanting something from, um, and so I I had her be an artist, she uh, but also like. She has her art turned into profit uh, by her own brother, and I think that like it's it's a very small part of the book, but even just like knowing that the one thing that she like loves and wants, he turns into a way for them to like, you know, survive, and for him to have something that he wants. I think it's just always a conflict throughout the book. Is like. How, how do we reckon with having someone want something from us that doesn't ever think about what we might want for ourselves? So I think that I definitely wanted art to, to play different roles in it. Right, it's one more way she gets exploited, even though much smaller than the biggest way. Um, well, this is going to be my last question because I want the audience to have time to ask questions. Um, what what would you want a reader to take away from the book, knowing that readers will have all of their own individual reactions? 
Um, I like to think of books as like either a mirror or a window for us. So like whether you can see something you've experienced in this book or it is like so far from anything that you've ever thought of, you know, we all we all use books as a way to enter something. And whether it's reflecting us back or it's expanding our idea of our country and our world, um, I want people to come away with with you know more care and attention to to how we are all complicit in the harm of black girls and black women. Um, and I think that we could all spend a little more time thinking about that. Well, the book does that and more. <laughs> um, it's hard to see with everyone's masks on, but um, I hope there are some people dying to ask questions. Um, Josie, should I call on people? Or where, where did Josie, bookseller Josie go? <laughs> <laughs> we can do it however we want. OK, well, does anyone have a burning question or a casual question? <laughs> I can keep asking. I can ask. Oh, I see a question in the audience there. I guess, so I, I didn't, I knew that it was set within like the last 10 years, I think by 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, like, when writing about Oakland, because I feel like I was trying to think like, oh, maybe she was going around and like sitting and like looking at places and kind of like writing scenes from that. But because the city has changed so much in the past year since COVID, like 2015, I'm trying to think of like what downtown looked like. And it's like so different. So I guess that my question is like, when you're writing the city, are you writing from like how you remember, like visually, like how it looked growing up or middle school or like? There are parts that are different. So the book like has a few flashbacks, and I tried to be really conscious of what what era the city was yeah. in in each flashback. Um, and so even with like Kiara's parents, um, I spent a lot of time talking to my dad about the like geography of the city um, decades ago and trying to to place it in context. Um, but I mean, I wrote the book in 2019. So we were, you know, seven, eight years into mass displacement, and I tried to pull from different different things that used to be there and aren't. Yeah. But the book is set in twenty fifteen. Um, so through those four years, there were a lot of shifts, but also that was like our first five years of experiencing like what it meant to live in the city um, and have it look so different, have every shop like we went to as kids closed down. Um, so I, I tried to pay a lot of attention to, to that and to setting it like really in the present moment in 2015, but also it was 2019 and I, how old was I? I was like 13, you know? So there was only so much I could do. <laughs> Uh, so I, I used my resources. I, I talked to you know people I love and who were older than me, and had um, more of a recollection of Oakland in 2015. But I also um, just tried to remember and take the things that have lasted too, because I think one thing about East Oakland is like it's one of the most preserved parts of the city. So uh, having the book exist there kind of meant that it it was more alive than. Um, most other parts. What was your emotional journey like from the beginning to the, I guess seeing the first hard copy of the book? <laughs> <laughs> emotional journey from the beginning. Um, well, when I started writing it, I didn't think anyone would ever read it. I am very private about my fiction, so I, di I didn't show it to anyone um, until I was like getting agented. Um, and so I think that for me, I just like I wanted to believe in it first, and um, and I found myself like through revisions going like, this is a story that just doesn't exist in the world right now, and like if that's not a reason to try to push it into the world, like I don't know what is. Um, and so I've kind of leaned on that even when I get like freaked out about the whole thing. Um, I mean, Oprah. <laughs> 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 It's, it's been a wild journey, and then seeing the copies was insane, and then seeing both copies, because you'll see today, they're stickered copies with Oprah Book Club on them, um, 
but there are also copies without them, and you know, like, just as an insane thing to, to go from like, having something in your head to something that is physical and will live beyond you. Yeah, I, I haven't processed it yet. <laughs> Give me a few months. <laughs> uh, I think that you did a really good job balancing like the fact that Kiara is a child and is like going through rapid growth and a lot of like tumultuousness and is unsure of a lot but also that she is like a very reliable narrator with a lot of emotional clarity, um, which is something that I think most writers do not do a good job at when writing young characters. <laughs> and people don't give young black girls like the emotional truth and I don't know, authorship of their own emotions. So I was wondering if you could speak to how you wrote such an effective teenage girl <laughs> and just like that balance. I mean, I think it's mostly because I, I was a teenage girl when I wrote it, and like most books are not are about young people are not by young people, uh, and I think that's because the world expects nothing from us, um, and I know so many amazing writers who you know are writing about that. Um, when they're in it and I think it's one thing that we do when we exit adolescence is we start judging. Um, our teenage self and you know there are there are things to judge sure but like <laughs> I also think that we give very little credit to what it means to have your emotions and experience heightened like that and have like no one validating that um, and so I wanted to write that right into that when I was still in it um, and I remember being like very aware that I couldn't write a 17 year old girl when I was not 17 in the same way. Um, so I, I said, I'll, just, I'll try it, and then here we are. Just branching off of Bella's question, like, I'm, probably not, I'm probably like maybe like a year older than you. <laughs> so like my view of the city is similar in the sense that like, I refer back when I'm like 12. I'm like 13 or something like that. And I'm, I'm thinking about that being a really solitary process of that remembering. And I'm like, at what point do you feel like you had to rely on like a community memory to like kind of connect and construct like a vision of Oakland that you just, you know, could only get so much? And like, did you find yourself like tapping other people? Yeah, it did. But um, also, my dad doesn't drive, like, terrified of driving and always has been. And so I spent most of my childhood like walking, taking the bus, taking BART, like even when I was, you know, two years old. So I think that that experience of like seeing the city from like, you're in it, like just in it, like buildings are taller, everything, but everything still, you know, is, is bigger than we ever experienced from like a car window. Um, so I think that I definitely had that to to reflect back on is like I I experienced the city in a very active way from a young age so I I remembered what it looked like to walk like on the street like maybe a foot shorter um, <laughs> when I was 10 and so I think that definitely contributed to my ability to like pull back um, even when I was really young but um, yeah I, I did a lot of talking to people who were older than me and just like Thing. Was that even around? I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and that definitely informed the work. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about the journaling a little bit more. Were you journaling, like, as Kiara, like, was she thinking back on an event that you already wrote about, or just like what, what she's thinking that day, and did yeah. that writing appear in the book? Yeah, like what she ate for breakfast, you know, that kind of thing. I think that you have to get inside someone's head to write from the first person in an effective way. And, you know, if, if I'm journaling as Kiara, then I need to journal about things Kiara would journal about. And so um, I just, like, would follow her through a day. And none of that is in the book. Um, they're just, like, pages of my journals that just say Kiara at the top. And, um, and I think it definitely contributed to me being able to do that. And I still do that for my characters now, if I need to get like deeper inside them. Thanks for your question. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I love 
on your book and specific fans. <laughs> and one, one of my favorite things about the book are the parts of Kiara's life that feel so normal and joyous, like the passage you read earlier tonight. How did you go about constructing normalcy for Kiara and balancing that with the very extreme circumstances that she's in? Um, I think there was a, there were many more like normal moments for her in the earliest draft uh, when I didn't know how to plot. I would just you know <laughs> go with her day, and, <laughs> uh, and I think that definitely helped when I tried to add back plot uh, because I knew everything about like how she spent her day, um, and that meant that like the moments that we get where she is just engaging in life without, you know, the heightened alarm of being so aware of the people around her, uh, those moments are, you know, kind of like a capsule of all of the moments that I wrote and took out. Um, so I think that that definitely is part of how I did it, but um, I, I love those parts too, and I think Trevor is a huge part of that, um, is like every scene with him was just like a breath for me, um, and I needed it because I, I wrote this like every single day and I didn't get out of her head and sometimes it was like rough to be in her head. Um, and so having Trevor was like, oh, he's so cute. Look at him walking. Um, and I think that I've definitely heard from readers too that like he's just so sweet and he like gives us something to just like cling on to when it feels like we've got nothing else. Hi. Um, just to go off of that for Trevor's character, um, and he's so lovable and so sweet, and their relationship is so heartwarming, and could you speak to how you developed his character, um, or where all of that kind of came from in you? Mm -hmm. um, I worked in preschools while I wrote this book. So I was surrounded by all these little kids, um, and anyone who knows me knows I love kids. And so I would, you know, I'd be writing by hand during nap time, and um, often Trevor scenes, so that I could just like take, you know, little people are just so present in every moment in a way that like is really hard for us. I think when we get older, um, I wanted to just like capture that and like cling to it in the way that Kiara would, um, because Kiara like needs to be able to experience being a kid, and she also like wants to remother him, but she's like a kid, and it's a complicated experience. And I think I felt that for for kids too who like need more uh, than they're getting, and you know you always want to give a kid that, um, and I think that is like how we often think about it, our, ourselves, is like we want to give our little self something that we didn't have, um, and projecting that onto Trevor, I think is one thing that Kiara does. So, um, I just love kids so much. They're just <laughs> the best. Diana has kids. <laughs> They're really sweet. They like to read. Sadly, they couldn't be here tonight disrupting the whole event. <laughs> I've always been a reader and a writer, but do you remember, was there like a moment as a young reader where you thought like, I could do this? Like, I could be one of those. When I read my favorite books, I go, I can't do that. Um, I think that's like a, a common experience as a writer is like, oh, I don't know if I could ever get there. But also like, I try to remember that we are always reading the last draft, right? So like the first draft, is just going to be shitty no matter what. And, um, and if we compare our first draft from, to a last draft, like it's never going to add up. Um, and so I, I think that as a, as a reader, um, I've had books that like I aspire to write something that would make me feel the way those books have, but, um, but it just like feels always daunting to write that. And I try not to read any book that I know I will love while I'm drafting. Because I think that it's dangerous territory and I've done it before and I end up like reading it back and going, oh wow, that's like the exact same book. And, um, and I think like 
I just don't want to be a writer that I'm not. Um, and I think that uh, with this book in particular, like I just didn't want to mimic anything, um, especially because there aren't stories like this. And so to have it exist in like a similar fashion as like another story wouldn't make sense. Um, so I tried to just like write the way I naturally do. Um, but I have so many books that I love. I just don't like. I read them and I go, oh, I can't. <laughs> Diana, how was it editing this book? <laughs> <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> it was it was a real pleasure. I have to say, um, for those of you who don't know, um, the the manuscript arrived on publishers and editors' desks um, maybe a month or two into COVID. Not even. It was like early April. Yeah, right? it was just a few weeks in, um, and it was you know a dark time for a lot of people. Um, <laughs> especially when there are little kids running around, so trying to work and be a parent. And your book was such a breath of fresh air, um, and it made me excited about reading again in a way that was really energizing. And so to be able to discuss it with you and ask you questions and read the different drafts was really a privilege. So. Thank you. <laughs> Should we end on that note, or are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you. You beat me to it, and I'm just gonna make you clap again. Can we give it up one more time? because I want to make sure you all have as much time as possible to chat and socialize um, and just share the excitement here with Layla tonight. We have books for sale at the register. You'll see the nice little Oprah Book Club seal on them. And just a reminder, this is a big secret until tomorrow. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining us here tonight, and I hope you have a great evening. Catch me on CBS this morning. <laughs> <It's 8 :30. laughs>